I wanted to be like a you know twenty two year old Kevin Smith that made a movie in New Jersey, went to Sundance, and did all that stuff. It just didn't happen that way, and I'm actually kind of grateful it didn't because I can imagine success at that age would have destroyed me. Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Tommy Avaloni's on the show. Tommy is a Los Angeles-based filmmaker who directed and produced one of my favorite documentaries over the last few years, The Bill Murray Stories. Life Lessons Learned from a Mythical Man, which is still on Netflix. He also directed the documentaries I Am Santa Claus and Ghost Heads, among others. His most recent film is Waldo on Weed, about the parents of a child, Waldo, with cancer. After Waldo becomes violently ill as a result of chemotherapy, his parents decide to give him CBD oil, which is illegal where they live in Philadelphia. Co-produced by Whoopi Goldberg, Waldo on Weed premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival and is now available on Amazon Prime. It can also be rented or purchased on iTunes and other streaming services. In this interview, you will hear about the challenges facing documentary filmmakers when it comes to working within the Hollywood film industry versus doing things on your own, what it's like networking and trying to sell a film in the festival circuit, how Tommy was able to combine home movies and present-day interviews to tell the Waldo on Weed story, how Whoopi Goldberg got involved in that project, what it was like trying to capture the essence of Bill Murray's Zen-like philosophy through the stories of those who had chance encounters with him, as well as what projects Tommy is working on now that will be coming out soon. So let's jump right into my conversation with filmmaker Tommy Avalone. Oh, you got a Bill Murray head back there. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that's that's my, usually my prop. We're definitely using this video. <laughs> Okay. So for my listeners, what I'm looking at is Tommy in, it looks like you're in your office, right? Yeah. And, uh, there is a Bill Murray head, uh, <laughs> right, right behind Tommy on a chair. And it's spitting image of, of Bill. Well, I mean, it's from the movie. It's the mask that's in the, the Bill Murray yeah. opening. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just, I have a severed head of Bill Murray in my office. <laughs> yeah. Tommy, thanks for making time for us. I know you're really No busy. problem. Yeah, so I have a I have a dermatology appointment after this, so hopefully I don't have cancer. <laughs> oh, you're you're actually getting a spot checked out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, Southern California uh, lifestyle, I guess, huh? Oh, it's on my back, and I don't. I normally never take my shirt off. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. I have ed editing weight, so like I just don't take my shirt off. So who knows? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're getting that checked out. Um, yeah. So, How are you? Where are you from? I'm in the Pacific yeah. Northwest, so I'm based out of uh, Central Washington, but I I have offices in uh, Seattle as well. Okay, but um, yeah, so pretty much Seattle based, Yakima based, and I've been to um, Seattle less than a day, but tried to do the Starbucks, did the that pier area. I think we did the uh, Cornell statue. Is that uh right? Chris Cornell. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. he's a little statue there, and then I did the troll. Okay, yeah. Oh, the troll under the the bridge, the Fremont yeah, yeah. troll. Okay, yeah. Well, you that's all you need to see. You've seen everything, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, although I think I drove by the Fraser spot. They like that uh, that the peak. What's that? It's in the the city skyline thing. What's the? Um... Oh, I know what you're talking about. It's uh, it's something park. It starts with a K. No, it's just and, it's just yeah. that the, the Seattle skyline. That right, like, yeah. But you see it from a park in oh, there's a, oh. in Seattle that has like the most picturesque uh, view of this the skyline. It's the Fraser thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm surprised that as much as you've traveled throughout the country on multiple films, uh, that you haven't spent more time in Seattle. Well, because when we were filming Waldo and Weed, Seattle was where we would fly into to go to Birmingham, which is like a two-hour drive. Yeah, drive. Yeah, after that, uh, and then we also went to the Port Townsend Film Festival, which is you're all you always just flying into Seattle and then um, going somewhere else. So it's like you know, you're done filming, you're at Seattle early for the airport. You're like, well, what can I do? Right. <laughs> so that Port Townsend's quite a drive. 
Yeah, from, from it's a crazy Seattle. town too because like it's very very cool, but very its own thing. Like, uh, like things shut down early. There's no like chains, which I'm not like against chains, but my son had like wasn't feeling well. I needed to get to CVS, and there was like no Ubers. You know, like there's no pharmacies open. Like the closest one was like 20 minutes away. So. I didn't have a car. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a very remote, isolated feeling when you're in Portland. It's cool Tanzania. though. Yeah, yeah. It's it, but it's it took me. I did an interview of a poet there uh, named Tess Gallagher last year, and I had no idea how long it would take me. It took me five hours to get there from from Yakima in Central Washington, and uh, I didn't think I. I mean, I thought five hours I'd be in Canada at that time, <laughs> but yeah, the the the, uh, the ferry and the, everything you have to go through to get there. Um, but anyway, welcome to Dream Path Podcast, Tommy. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. So tell us about uh, Waldo on Weed. I watched the film, by the way. It's on Amazon Prime. Um, and I, I really enjoyed it. And I thought you accomplished some things with this film that, uh, with this documentary that uh, you're not really expecting. And so tell us, tell us about your approach to this, how you found the story, and um, what you would like audiences to know about it. Uh, to maybe get them to hop onto Amazon and see it. Well, the thing I, I want people to know is it's available to watch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, you know, if I uh, feel like paying for it or it's on free for Amazon uh, Prime. But yeah, I mean, uh, my friend Brian uh, is the father of the son Waldo. He was very popular in the Philadelphia area. I'm from New Jersey, but I would work in Philadelphia. Um, and, uh, he had this pizza place called pizza brain, which is a very crazy pizza shop that had all this pizza and I can never say the word right. Memorabilia. Um, and he's just, he was a character, you know, and then every city there's, there's characters. And Brian was certainly one of them. He had like tall orange hair. Um, and I reached out to him. I was like, let's do something on pizza. That would be fun. Right? Like pizza. Um, and he's like, actually, you know, I'm, I'm kind of getting, kind of leaving the, the pizza shop soon. My son has uh, just got over uh, his first round with like, Oh, at the time it was his first round of cancer. Uh, and he was telling me about how he illegally smuggled cannabis oil. This is, a, you know, at the time when Waldo had cancer, it was 2014 going into 2015. So it wasn't legal in Pennsylvania at the time. Uh, and he was just telling me all about the story and how he filmed it. And he's not sure if I'll ever do anything with the footage, but he has it. And we kind of just kept in touch and, uh, one thing led to another, and we kind of took that footage, turned it into a documentary. Uh, we filmed interviews uh, of them throughout the years, uh, put it together. Whoopi Goldberg was our executive producer. We premiered at Tribeca, and now you can watch it on Amazon Prime. <laughs> yeah. Well, t tell us how you connected with Whoopi. Um, it's such a boring story. We just were both rep by William Morris, and it just they we showed them the, the sizzle that we put together. And she liked it, you know, and we just knew she had an opinion on cannabis and uh, had done a bunch of different documentaries herself. Um, and we just wanted someone that kind of could help us uh, craft a story that was a little bit more universal uh, for everyone to to watch. Yeah. Because, I mean, to me personally, like, I've never smoked pot a day in my life. Like, I'm not a cannabis user. Uh, I'm not even a fan of cannabis. I, you know, I just wanted to tell a story about what a father would do to save his son. You know, and they just happened to use cannabis to save that. You know, right. so that's why we interviewed uh, anti-cannabis uh, people, uh, CALM, Citizens Against Legalization of Marijuana. Like, you know, interviewing doctors at Harvard that are saying, hey, this there could be something good about it here. It's really interesting to see both sides and the fears and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, going, through, like, to me, pot was uh, Cheech and Chong movies or Half-Baked, you know, and now it's, you know, watching or listening to Brian's story and seeing the doctors kind of talk about it, it's really interesting where everything is now, at least, you know, six years now since Waldo's cancer. You made a comment about the story and sort of the, the lack of agenda that you had going into it. And, oh, yeah, no and, agenda. And it made me, and, and I, I noticed that as I was watching it, you, you weren't trying to sell anything in the film. Uh, I mean, you're just you're telling a story, but really what it is, it's like, um, I don't know if this is a bad analogy, but when you first hear about Game of Thrones, and if you're not into fantasy, you're not into dragons, you know, you're not into 
uh, kings and queens and all of that. Um, sorry, there's there's a lawnmower outside of my house. Oh, I can't hear it. Norm- normally, I, I do these uh, in the afternoon. Sorry. Um, but if you if you don't like that type of approach, you can still be brought into Game of Thrones because of the story. Really, there's there are universal themes that are happening sure. within Game of Thrones. And I, and I kind of found with Waldo on Weed that even if you don't like pot or you're anti-pot or whatever, this is a story of parents who love their child so much that they're willing to break the law uh, and to make him comfortable and to get him better, whatever way possible. And it's that universal theme that I really connected with. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of times people will have an opinions and stuff without thinking about the people who go through it, you know, and and Brian and Danielle, the, the parents of Waldo, you know, they went through this and it was very, very it wasn't just an opinion. It was a, a thing that they went through, like they could very well have lost their son. Um, and yeah, and I don't I don't make agenda movies. I just I, I tend to like to make movies about characters. And I thought the Dwyer family was very interesting characters and they were going through an interesting uh, experience. It was it's really the only one of my movies that really the character like changed from the beginning to the end. You know, we spent, I want to say four years with them. Um, starting with the dad cam footage of what Brian would film himself. Like Brian, a lot of the minute movie is Brian on a flip cam. If you remember those sort of cameras, right. Um, filming himself for his own sort of therapy of it. And we use these, these sort of uh, this video because what was interesting about that is like, you know, we're not a documentary crew. There's no documentary crew. There's no mic. There's no lights. You know, it's just kind of like a father with his own thoughts and there's no real performance there. And which I really liked about that sort of part. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is, I think really the only one of like, you know, my movies tend to have some sort of comedic uh, angle to it. And I, I think that what's great about this one, and even though it's a pretty intense subject matter, Waldo is hilarious. You know, Brian and Danielle are funny people. Uh, Brian, I mean, Waldo's uncles, Mike and Larry, um, they're very humorous. Look, we get laughs in a cancer movie. So that's very uh, exciting to me because sometimes those sort of movies, you're like, oh, I don't want to watch that. That seems really heavy. A lot's going on. I don't want to watch. I don't want to be dragged down. But it's a really good story about hope and and family, you know, and I think that's uh, kind of important nowadays. Yeah, they are they are characters. I I'm glad you <laughs> pointed that out because you. yeah, it's very Philly and um, his bright orange hair. It's it's almost like um, they're they're hand picked, almost like you casted it to be some you know this interesting and captivating, especially Brian. Yeah, I mean, well, that's how I mean. I just thought Brian was an interesting character, and I went to him for pizza. It just so happened that he had this like crazy life experience that was happening. Yeah, so. Tell us about the the found footage experience as opposed to because I, I look at Waldo on Weed as kind of a, a found footage yeah. um, endeavor where you're taking all this footage and trying to organize it, but also figuring out how to incorporate your own footage and the you know how to fill in the gaps. What mm-hmm. what was that process like? It was very very tedious. I mean, you're just watching home videos, you know I mean? Like, you know, you, you film a documentary and you go, well, these are story points or these are questions I ask, or there's a reason why we're filming this stuff. And sometimes there was absolutely no reason Brian was filming at all, you know, like, so you're just kind of going through a lot of times where, you know, he's just, uh, just doing whatever. So it's a lot of, I mean, think of like any home videos you might have, you know, it's like, and then how do you create a narrative out of that? You know? So it was Brian was very helpful, you know. He'd be like, "Oh, you know, I was going through this in like this month of this year," and then the footage was, you know, organized quite well, where it was kind of like by the month, by the year. So that was helpful. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of personal, and it's so weird too. Like cause Brian would call me a couple times, and I was like, "I can't, I can't talk to you right now. I uh, I spent four four hours of listening to you today. I can't, I can't have any more." <laughs> <laughs> and it was a really weird experience because like he. He wouldn't be there for those uh, those conversations uh, physically. It was just past Brian, you know. And it was just like I just enough Brian today, you know. <laughs> but he he understood. Yeah. Well, I I'm really excited to see where this goes for you because um, I you know you you hit uh, was it no it was Tribeca that you got into last year with uh, Waldo on Weed. 
Uh, it was 2019. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tell us about the film festival circuit and the the hustle of getting your film seen by film festival folks and and submitted and hopefully part of a festival so that it can be um, you know seen by more audiences and hopefully picked up for distribution. I mean, I love the festivals. You feel like a like a star for like a like a week, week and a half. You know, there's these fun parties, these fun get-togethers, free food. Uh, you know, the screenings, the press. Um, I enjoy it. You know, Tribeca is a little different. I've been to Tribeca twice, um, and you know, New York is already a buzz. So it, sometimes it gets lost in that where it's like. But like with like a South by Southwest or hot docs, you know, you're going to Austin, you're going to Toronto and the, the places have turned around for this festival. So you're, you're constantly walking around with people that have badges on, you know, in New York, you just, you just blend in with, with everything, you know, there's, everyone's already there, you know? Right. Right. Kind of like Seattle, Seattle International Film Festival is the same way. There's just, it's, it's kind of spread out. It's in the city as opposed to like Sundance, which is like everybody you see on the street is wearing their tags and yeah i mean i've never been to sundance yet uh but you know with bill murray you know we premiered at south by southwest our international premiere was at a hot docs uh we went to bfi in london and they're all just great experiences of you know just having the movies play and getting to getting together to meet like other filmmakers you know that that's i love the idea of like kind of like hanging out with your class Mm mm-hmm you know, uh, especially last year at Tribeca, well, 2019 at Tribeca, I really like tried to like look around the, the, to other docu- you know, documentary movies or documentary directors that, you know, I was like, oh, I, I you know, I, I like your style. I'm, you know, let's, let's, let's hang out, you know, and like, and I, I just kind of dig that stuff because I have these like fantasies of like, you know, the Tarantinos and Rodriguez is like hanging, hanging out together or, you know, even like, uh, Spielberg hanging out with Lucas and like that, that whole, like whoever's cl- class that you're in, you know, I, I like that idea. And I'm not saying I'm at that level, but like on this like small little circuit of festivals, you can kind of like play around or hang out with people who are around about your, uh, area, you know? Yeah. And do you, do you find that in those festivals that a lot of business gets done that you, that's where the sales are made and the distribution deals are made? No, <laughs> I mean they're talked about, but yeah. it's, I mean, to my experience, it's never. You're never having that 1994 Sundance uh, Kevin Smith. You know, let's talk at a coffee shop, sign a deal, get paid a lot of money, and your life changes. Moment. You know, I, I don't right. know if I don't know if those things happen. They certainly don't happen to me. You know, I, I hear these stories and these myths of it happening, but I don't. I, that's not my. That's not my encounters. Yeah. And, and how important is it to have someone like Whoopi attached to a project to actually be taken seriously? Because I would imagine that there's so much content out there now. I mean, the, the number of documentaries, um, I'm just assuming based upon my Netflix queue, right. that the number of documentaries now is 10 times more than it was a decade ago. Well, sure. Because um, there's a way to watch them. You mean like how many times have you actually watched a documentary in the theater? You know, I mean, I saw Super Size Me in the theater. I saw, um, you know, uh, Fahrenheit uh, 9-11. You know, I seen that one in the theater. I even saw the Conan O'Brien documentary in the theater. But that's, I mean, that, that was really about it back then, you know. And now, like, you can just, documentaries are made kind of for that streaming. I think that's why, obviously, there's. Yeah. Yeah. Uprise, but like you know, Whoopi's great, and and having people like that. I mean, I try to surround myself with big and good executive producers. You know, Morgan Spurlock uh, executive produced I Am Santa Claus. Glenn Zipper uh, executive produced Bill Murray stories. Uh, Whoopi uh, was Wild on Weed. You know, like I don't know if it's my own complex or or something that you need to do, but like I always just want to show to someone that I'm just not some punk kid from New Jersey. You know, trying to make a movie. I, I, you know, I have someone vouching for me, so I'm not, I'm not sure if it's um, necessary or just something that uh, I need for myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's smart. I mean, yeah. it, it's not going to hurt to have a big name like Spurlock yeah. or, or Goldberg um, attached to, uh, 
to a project. So tell us, you, you mentioned Jersey and, and I read, uh, obviously there's a lot online about your, your run for mayor. Uh, can you, <laughs> can you tell us, there? <laughs> yeah, there, there's quite a bit. So can you tell us how that came about? Why did you decide to run for mayor at the age of, was it 19 or 20? Uh, I, I was 20 when I ran, but I was 21 when the election happened. Okay. Uh, so, um, but, um, what was going on in your life that made you decide, you know what, I'm going to run for office. I'm just a huge Andy Kaufman fan, you know, <laughs> and, uh, I just love, I love a bit, you know, and that okay. was, that's really what it was. You know, like I didn't have any, I, I'm not a political person by any means. You know, I, I think it's, it's funny, uh, to have run. I, I, I was student council president of my high school and I thought, oh, I could just do the same thing. You know, like I had, I had, uh, people, my friends dress up like in suits and they're my bodyguards. They're, uh, Tommy's Angels, you know, um, we would do these press conferences and give out milk and cookie to the press. Uh, I was on CNN, you know, I was like, it was like all these like news coverage. Like, Cause at the time Arnold Schwarzenegger was running. Right. And it was like, Ar this, this is happening in California, but in local news, a 20 year old from <laughs> that, you know, and it was just a way to talk about the movies I was doing. You know, it was very, uh, just, it was just like, um, I had a rap song. You they would know? think it was brilliant. Actually, yeah, it I was mean, just it was just funny. Man, I was actually at the time I was going to try to make a documentary. I have like ten to twelve, possibly fourteen hours, which is not much, uh, of just like what I was doing to run. Uh, and I was like, oh, I could make a documentary out of this, and I just never did anything with it because it was just this wasn't good. Uh, but like, I just I just thought it was would be funny to do, you know. And I just I thought it I just thought it would be funny. Have you ever? How far into a project have you gone uh, and decided, or I don't even know if this has ever happened, but and decided that it just isn't going to work? You know, you, you're maybe 40 hours into it, 80 hours of footage, and you're like, oh, this is a great idea at the time. But have you ever had to kill your baby like that? Well, don't let being a father, I don't like to call any of my projects a baby because I have enough yeah. respect for my children. <laughs> right. Uh, but, um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's, I've been, in the last like year and a half, I've been like developing a lot of stuff and there's certain things that I just kind of like fall out of interest in, you know, um, I'm a pack rat, you know? So like, I don't ever feel like something would, if I put time into it and I have footage of it or I have something with it, um, I think I'd still find a way to do something with it. You know, even that mayor footage, I'll do something with it eventually. I just don't know what it is. Right. You know, like, uh, I just, yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm constantly collecting puzzle pieces, and I just don't currently know what puzzle I'd be using that puzzle piece for. Um, uh, we were thinking about trying to do this, like, documentary on Hollywood, and I, I filmed an interview with Alice Cooper, and we filmed a couple things, and I don't know. I just kind of, currently have no interest in continuing it but i'm sure i'll do something with that footage eventually you know i'm sure that that interest will reignite at one point you know so like mm -hmm. it's never a, a a squashed idea i just think it's like i'll come back to it oh so you're not killing the project you're just tabling it and maybe there's another opportunity down the road where it'll fit into something that you're focusing on yeah i think that's the way i like to look at it yeah 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 well, um, yeah, Elizabeth Gilbert talks, I don't know if you've ever read Eat, Pray, Love or any of her books. I haven't, but I've listened to interviews with um, authors. I've watched parts of the movie. Uh, so, so Elizabeth Gilbert talks about her process of writing and stories and stories that she's inspired to tell, and then also the process of losing that inspiration and losing interest yeah. in it. And she does the same thing. I mean, she just catalogs ideas and just kind of keeps them and also has this concept of you know what maybe i'm not the one who was meant to tell this story maybe yeah. it's someone else and maybe they can kind of in a generous way let them pick up where you know she left off or something yeah um, i mean there's recently there's been things that i've been like playing around with that were something that i been wanting to do like 10 years ago you know so it, it's always it's like, oh, that would make sense now, you know, or, oh, I could, I could tell that better now, you know? 
So what does a day in the life of Tommy Avalone look like in terms of um, your, you know, you're, you're looking for ideas, you're nurturing and cultivating ideas you already have. Um, you're collaborating, I imagine, with a lot of folks. Is there, is there a typical day in the life of Tommy Avalone? It's, I guess it's just trying to stay focused. Uh, you know, I wake up early, uh, then I'm, I'm with my kids for a little bit and then me and my wife kind of switch. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, like right now we're about to pitch this, uh, project next week and I'm, I'm trying not to be excited about that because, you know, I just got my feelings hurt too many times when things don't happen, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, for example, like you were, you were saying that like, um, you know, squashing projects and all that sort of stuff. We, we were pitching something, um, oh God, about maybe a month, two months ago. And everyone said no. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to make it. You know, it's like, <laughs> like, I don't need you. Like, I don't need anything, you know, like I'll just, uh, it was going to be like a TV show sort of thing. And I was like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to start filming as a documentary and I'll just do it myself, you know? Um, and uh, I kind of had that mentality, you know, like, I don't like, you know, even when you were asking me in the beginning, like about like, well, I, I, I'm not a, like a salesman. Like I don't like selling anything, you know, I just like making it. And I remember like very, very early on when I was younger, someone's like, Oh, uh, why should I watch your movie? And I was like, you know what? Don't bother. <laughs> Cause like, I just not, I mean, I love talking about movies. I love talking about even the process of stuff like that. But like, I couldn't tell you why someone should watch some of my movies you know i can tell you why i'm interested in making them and why i liked making them you know but like i don't know i'm not i'm not a good salesman i, I think i got off on a tangent here <laughs> this is currently where my brain is and i'm just working through something no this, i love it this, this is today's is shower stuff. uh conversation i had with myself that i've brought into your podcast no it's good stuff so you, you mentioned that you didn't need you you pitched an idea and you didn't need these people you're going to run with it uh, on your own. So that leads me to the, the question, how much do you need like investors and folks that are, you know, how big is your team and your operation to make a film like the Bill Murray stories or Waldo on wheat? Yeah. I mean, like I'm very, very, I don't want to say lucky because I don't believe in that, but I'm very like, I appreciate the people that are around me, you know, like I have people uh, that believe in in me and the ideas I have and and help me along with you know my producers and you know f people around me that like um, can tell these like stories on a small budget. You know, it's a very independent uh, way of doing it. You know, Santa, Ghostheads, Murray, Waldo is all made independently. And then sold outright, you know, playing oh. the festivals, doing all that sort of stuff. Um, what I've been trying to figure out in the last, you know, couple of years is to, like how to like, figure out how to play inside the system, you know. And in doing that, you need a lot of like pitches and green lights and people to say yes and people who don't get it. And they go, what about a game show version of that? And you go, nope, nope. You know, like there's a, so there's a lot of like that sort of thing. And um you know, I like making independent movies and I like doing that sort of stuff. But like in order to try to grow, you know, you have to figure out a way to like work inside the system. And that's I mean, I, I like to think that each movie we've made, we've grown and been able to tell, you know, different and bigger, or you know, better stories. And that's I wouldn't I don't want to keep doing the same thing. So it's just trying to figure that out. And working inside the system is very difficult. Um, and that, that's all it is. You know, it's just it's just difficult. Yeah. Well, I interviewed uh, Brian Knappenberger uh, at Sundance this year, and he's he made the the Trials of Gabriel Fernandez, which is on Netflix, and uh, is a pretty interesting guy. And documentaries are his focus, but he talked about the the pressures that that come with money, the expectations of somebody financing your project versus uh, you financing your project independently, like you're saying, and then bringing it to someone that has money to sell it. And he much prefers to go about it independently. So he doesn't have those, you know, the sense of obligation or, you know, running something by a team as he's creating the story. Um, is that kind of the way you look at filmmaking? I mean, it's just like, everything keeps changing, 
you know, like when, when Bill Murray came out in 2018, you know, the way people would buy or acquire movies started to shift, you know, like people didn't want to buy finished movies. They wanted to like be on the, well, like, you know, quote unquote ground floor. Um, you know, that, and that ground floor means many different things to many different people, you know? Um, you know, some people it, it works and sometimes it, the, the story is just so this or, you know, or there's, you know, this is a movie that needs to be made independently because no one would understand it in the pitch, you know, and like there's so much discovery and then all that sort of stuff. Like so there's definitely the, the people that need to make it. And, you know, we've done that in the past. I mean, like no one would have been like, here's, you know, no network would have been like, here's, um, you know, we... You, you don't have Bill Murray attached and you want to make a movie about Bill Murray stories, like go ahead, <laughs> you know, like that's not going to happen. You have right. to make that independently, you know? Um, so that, you know, this, I'm just, you know, when you're speaking about that person, like he has that experience of working inside the system and I just, I'm working on that, you know, like, uh, cause it's just, it's just interesting to me to see what that experience would be like. So how hard did you chase bill murray in terms of getting him to sign off on that project uh and be involved in some way and and when did you just give up (laughs) well i didn't chase him never no you never chased him well i mean you called his 800 number and not chase yeah well i mean well pursue maybe chase is a is a strong word but you know you emailed me to be on the podcast did you chase me no no that's (laughs) i actually i did i did i i you know it was i'm everything I, i i consider everything I do to be kind of a hustle. Like I, sure. you know, I'm always looking for um, people who are inspiring to me and how do I convince those people to talk to me, you know, uh, somebody they probably have never heard of before. And I would imagine that that same dynamic has occurred with oh, yeah. you know, I mean, a lot no, of the folks. That you're, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, I like, I just, I just, I, I tend to like argue over the words of it, you know, like to no, me, like fair point. Uh, one, you know, you don't hear what I'm saying on those phone calls in the movie because I'm never asking his permission to make the movie, you know, and I'm never asking him to be in it either. You know, like really what I'm, I'm telling, I'm telling him that we're doing this project and I love to talk to him about it. Mm. You know, like our, our process was, uh, we are making a Bigfoot documentary. Uh, Bigfoot is not Bill Murray. Bigfoot is the Bill Murray stories, you know? So if you're making a Bigfoot movie and trying to like capture the magic that is Bigfoot, do you sit down with Bigfoot at the end, like 2020 style and go, so, you know, what's with the woods? You know, like it's, this doesn't, it destroys the magic and destroys Ah. that kind of the idea of what a Bill Murray story is. It's magical. It's mythical. You know, how do you Mm -hmm. answer some of these questions of reality to them? and tell these real stories with keeping that sort of magic and, you know, urban legend alive, you know, and it's just, you never talk to Bill, you know, like, so like we would just kind of like mention certain things to him or, or, or not to him, to his answer machine, uh, to like ideas how we wanted to like, Hey, could you like walk by a scene in this and all that sort of stuff? Uh, but he just never replied back to me and you know, that's totally fine. Um, so so in this encounter that we we talked to the river sharks with, um, we just knew Bill would be there, you know, and that was our truthful experience with Bill at that time. And you know, my favorite part about making these movies is because like it was, it's it, you know, this particular trip was me, um, my producer camera guy uh, Derek Kunzer, and uh, a friend of mine who's a camera guy uh, Chris Rab uh, from Jackass fame, uh, mm-hmm. Rab himself. And my favorite part is always the ride home after these things, you know, like talking about what we just grabbed and, you know, how would you use this structurally and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, I think I could frame the whole movie about this encounter. You know, like if I take that picture, because I was like, my thought is, if you show that picture of me and Bill, then you rip that bandaid off. This is not a chase. You know, this is not a, um, Mm. you know, well, Tommy, get Bill in this movie. You know, first three minutes of the movie, there's a picture of me and Bill. Obviously, I met him. So here's 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 the real movie about Bill Murray stories. You know, uh, it's not my date with Drew. It's not you know uh, me like searching out this person to have an experience with them. It's talking about these experiences. So, uh, and I mean no disrespect to my na- my date with Drew. You know, it's a it's a good movie, and it's a 
you know, that's what that story was, but ours wasn't that. Yeah. Well, do you think that the Bill Murray stories up to, I mean, we, I guess the, um, Waldo on weed movie still has to play out before we find out how well it's going to be received. Uh, but do you think that you're most well known for the Bill Murray stories? Oh over, yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, like we have Bill Murray's name in the title of our movie. Like, I don't know <laughs> if I'll ever have anything that's a little more well known than that. You know what I mean? Like, um, I remember like, you know, we would sell out every single screening at South by Southwest, you know, and at hot docs in Toronto, we had like three nights of 700 people sold out. Like, that's crazy. You know, like that doesn't happen. And we wouldn't pay for any publicity. We wouldn't do like any, you know, we weren't even handing out flyers, you know, it was just in the program, Bill Murray stories with a B, you know, so you're like the, the beginning parts of the festival programming, you know, uh-huh. opposed to Waldo on weed, you know, like <laughs> well, at the, the very end, end, you know, yeah. um, like I just remember sitting there and going, it will never be. I mean, I shouldn't say, I always try to correct myself when I say this, but like my, when I th- my thought was it will never be this easy again to get people to see the movie. And I like to think people heard it was good. And that was another reason for seeing it. But, you know, it's a movie about something that everyone loves it's, you know, it's the beginning of the alphabet as far as the program goes. So it was, it was, I very much understand that that movie uh, is so much more recognizable. I mean, it's on Netflix, it's on Netflix. It was on people's airplane. Like, I mean, like you're flying and you can go, Hey, uh, Bill Murray stories, you know, uh, less like 80 minute movie. Sure. You know, like it, it was, it's definitely, uh, I mean, I am Santa Claus, Walt on weed. Some people know. Ghost Bill Murray's story, yeah. as I mentioned, people go, I think I've seen that, or I've seen it on Netflix, like uh, the icon, you know, <laughs> you know? So what are the legal challenges to taking clips of movies, you know, Bill Murray movies and, and interview clips uh, that, you know, you, you have this great collection of Bill Murray footage, but mm-hmm. legally, how do you get to the point where you can actually put it in the film, distribute it, put it on Netflix? I mean, we're not abusing any of the footage. It's called a uh, fair use, you know? So it's all fair use, huh? Yeah. I mean, yeah. majority of it, you know, like, uh, I mean, in no way are we just putting it on to put it on. It's like, we're just proving a, a point in our, like, you know, uh, our narrative. So yeah, I mean, I'm really, I've gotten pretty good at like at how to edit with fair use, you know? And, you know, a lot of the, I mean, you know, when we talk to journalists and they, they mention like, coffee and cigarettes or zombie land um or even um god it's been a while um razor's edge um you know these are important notes in bill murray's career where he kind of talks about or does these sort of bill murray stories in in the in the movies you know so you could you can point to what he does in real life to um to that so yeah i mean it was all it's all fair use. I mean, it's a boring answer, but yeah, is this, we, we, we can. Yeah. I, 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 Bill Murray's stories for me was really special. And you saw that I did a, a duo cast or a short little podcast on it yeah. with my producer and editor. But what I really appreciated about the Bill Murray stories is it takes you I mean, you sort of, um, you, you, you watch it with the understanding that it's going to be a chase and you quickly realize that it's, not a chase it's more of an exploration of the philosophy of bill murray and at least that's my takeaway from the film yeah i mean we try to make these like sort of trojan horse movies you know you walk in and go hey isn't christmas and santa claus great here here's something about you know identity and community you know it's like hey bill murray is cool right let's talk about living in the moment and being present you know like um i think there's fun little scenarios to do with those sort of situations. And, and majority of the movies that I make, people go, I, I wasn't expecting that, you know? So, and I take that as a compliment, you know, like I, I like, you know, Bill Murray stories. Like, I love that movie. I hope that's okay to say about your own stuff, but like, <laughs> I just, I think there was so many ways for us to go down a different path that wouldn't end in the way we made that movie. You know, I mean, it's just, uh, I was reluctant to put myself in there, you know, like uh, a lot of, I watched so many documentaries on purpose that were bad that people put themselves in to not, to not do with that, not to do that, you know? Cause like, 
you know, Morgan Spurlock does it fantastic. Michael Moore does it great, you know, but there's, I could tell you off camera and off record of a whole list of people who right. don't, you know, and that was, you know, Santa Claus and Waldo. I'm not in it. I'm, you know, cause that's not the kind of movies I want to, I want to make, but like, we just felt like that was like the, the only way to do a through line that made sense to kind of connect these. So the hardest thing was that movie was trying to make it not a bunch of just like vignettes. So you're not just watching webisodes on YouTube or something like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's way more than that. It's, uh, there, there's a gestalt to the film that is very Zen and, and almost Buddhist because I think his, his Buddhism and, or his approach to life really comes through in the interviews with all of the, you know, the collateral interviews that you got. Um, but also just these impromptu brushes with um with folks ra- you know randomly off the street and at parties and stuff it it really makes you appreciate the spontaneity that he is gra- he gravitates towards every day and um and i think that we can all learn a lesson from the bill murray stories about how to live life yeah uh you know i i hope i'm not overstating it when i say that but it, it sounds like an exaggeration about a documentary that it that it that would be the takeaway. But for me, that was the takeaway. Yeah. You know, like uh, when we play at South by um, this nice lady came up to us afterwards and was like, I, you know, I, um, I just saw your movie uh, and I had like a two hour gap before I was going to visit my friends. And I would have just normally went to my hotel and took a nap, but like, you know, I was like, well, what would Bill do? So like, I just kind of did this and did that. And I just had a great time, you know? So it's like, it's really, like, you know, you can't help but see someone like Bill Murray, who, for the most part, uh, has been around your whole life, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? And you see him in these movies. Oh, yeah, he's a Ghostbuster or he's a don't hassle the local, you know? Like, there's all these, like, things that you put, like, when you see him kind of, like, just, like, take life the way he does, I mean, it's just, it's one of those things where, like, I would like to do that, you know? And you know, some people have the, like the, the answer, well, if I had that kind of money, I could just like, no. no. No, he was doing it way before he was uh, rich or way before he was famous. Right. You know, B- Bills has always kind of been that way, you know? I mean, I think it's improved as he's learned more. I mean, he studied uh, G.I. Gurdjieff, uh, you know, or Del Close in Second City. These are all like people that I think helped kind of build that, live in the moment, wake people up or wake yourself up. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just all about staying awake. Ah, oh, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Wake yourself up, wake other people up. And what a, what a nice way to approach life. Well, when he, when Razor's Edge, like Razor's Edge was what he wanted to do, you know? Uh, and he filmed that, then filmed Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters came out, huge hit. But then Razor's Edge came out and people weren't ready for him to be that Bill Murray, you know, that Bill Murray kind of came out later in life and people were ready for it, but they weren't ready for it in the eighties. And when that movie didn't do well, he was like, you know, forget it. I'm just, I I'm done. And him and his family moved to France. And that's where you like, he studied philosophy and he was Gurdjieff, this guy, if you look him up, uh, he would do these things. We were going to put it in the movie, but just, it just didn't work out, but he would like, you know, hit people with stuff and like try to wake them up and all that sort of stuff. And, that kind of philosophy that his books uh, were all around that second city sort of tribe, you know, how mm-hmm. Ramus knew about it, um, Pelushi and all that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, everyone called Bill Murray that sort of like Gurdjieff, like the trickster God. Uh, and so that was like really in the back of his mind during I guess, at least that part of his life, or maybe a little even before, uh, but he eventually came back and did movies again, obviously. But uh, I mean, it's just, it's just that mindset and combined with Del Close. Del Close is very much like that, taking, taking improv off the stage and into real life. Have you ever explored the concept of charisma and tried to deconstruct what charisma is? Because I, I look at Bill Murray as one of the most charismatic figures on film or television. Same thing with someone maybe like, uh, with like Jack Black or, it's it's the type of person who, when they walk into a room, it's like everyone's eyes are drawn yeah. to this person. And why is that? Why is it is it the in the moment um, existence that they live and that they 
they adhere to or what are what are your thoughts on charisma i mean i I could talk to him about Bill's, you know, and with Bill, it's like, he just doesn't care. You know, I, I, my opinion of Bill is that he doesn't care in that. I think it's, it's in their movie where as someone taught him a long time ago, um, God, it's been a while, but it, it, it's been like, um, I think it's just the idea that to be relaxed, you know, you know, if once I think we gravitate towards someone who is in, is comfortable in their own skin, you know, and, when they're walking a room, they're not bringing anxiety. They're not bringing their own stress or all that sort of stuff. Mm. I think Bill tends to be, and I don't know this. I just, you know, from my studies, it just seems like he's very calm and collected and just, if he's there, he wants to be there. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, I think that kind of calmness uh, is something that could be possibly felt. Right. He's not coming in with expectations about yeah. what he wants from somebody and he's in a very del close kind of way a yes, he's in a yes and state of mind all the time you know willing to go wherever it needs I to go i think it's it's a practice you know like i i think there's this audio that we we have from Gavin Edwards who wrote the uh, the Dow of Bill Murray which is a great book um and he he in in the thing bill just talks about how he's like you know you you talk about living in the moment it's like you can't always live in the moment. You can't always be present. You know, it's, it's, it's something that you attempt and you try to be as much as you possibly can. You know, he's like, he's like, sometimes I'll be like, he's like, I just need to wake myself up. I've been like asleep for like four days, you know? Uh, And I think that's the thing. It's like, it's just like, you can like kind of catch yourself in moments where you, you were like, all right, well, let's, let's get it together. Let's be here. You know, and it's, I think it's a practice. Yeah. Kind of like meditation is a practice. You can't, yeah, you, know, yeah, you yeah. can't always be meditating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, tell us about your your calling to, toward documentary uh, as opposed to narrative film, and why you're in that space, um, and your filmography reflects that. Yeah, I mean, like I wanted, I wanted to be, I wanted to be like a, you know, 22 year old Kevin Smith that made a movie in New Jersey, went to Sundance and did all that stuff. It just didn't happen that way. And I'm actually kind of grateful it didn't because I can imagine uh, success at that age would have destroyed me. Uh, (laughs) uh, You know, I, I I was lucky enough to meet Kevin uh, and, you know, he interviewed us, uh, after Santa and all that sort of stuff. And he was like, you know, he's like, I'll never understand what life I was supposed to live. Cause I was kind of plucked out of obscurity, you know, like he was like this new life was presented in front of him, you know? Um, but, uh, so I've always wanted to do that. And I just felt like my skill set wasn't there. You know, like I have a tendency to think that, uh, I can't dictate what's in my head for an actor to do. Uh, I tried it a couple different times, but I, I realized later in life that I was like, oh, I wasn't really working with real actors. I was working with my friends, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I think it's like half and half. Like maybe I wasn't fully ready to be a, a narrative director and they just don't want to be actors. You know, they're just kind of doing me a <laughs> favor. Uh, there's no prep work. You know, it's like they're reading the line right there and going, oh, all right, you know? Yeah. So, uh so I stopped directing and I went into producing a couple of scripted stuff. Uh, Miss December, Kevin Smith actually did put out um, and I just produced that. Uh, but then I kind of, you know, our Miss December movie, I uh, was playing at a festival that Morgan Spurlock was playing there and we had a couple of mutual friends and I told him I had this idea for a Santa Claus documentary and we kind of just started talking about it. And that's really, I, I always thought about doing documentaries. Like I, I try to do a documentary on a karaoke guy that I knew in my own mayoral run. Uh, but it was the Santas that really, I was like, I'm just going to do this. And I guess I, I, I was, I felt my skills as a director or more so an editor in that were a lot better than the ones I was using as a writer director uh, so I just kind of like kept following that thread in my life, you know? Um, and I'm re- I feel like I'm really good at like following someone or finding characters and being able to tell their story through the edits. Like I edit up my own stuff. Um, I eventually would like to get into scripted again. 
I should say again, I would like to get into scripted. Uh, but you know, I, I still got a bunch of different docs that we're pitching and all that sort of stuff. So I think eventually I'd like to get there. Uh, but yeah, yeah. It, sound, it sounds like a very organic journey for you. I mean, yeah. Well, I just like, I had this idea who I wanted to be, but I just kind of like listened, <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. I mean, be yes to end my own stuff, but like, I just, uh, it wasn't ever like forcing anything. It was just kind of like, these are the things I'm interested in. And I do is just follow those interests, you know? Do you think documentary filmmaking for folks who just want to get into storytelling visually, um, do you think that documentary filmmaking is more accessible for folks than narrative films, scripted films? Yeah, I guess so. You know, because like, you know, uh, you can kind of play around with, things is just it's maybe it's cheaper to make you know um like for you know i could use it was easier for me to make a documentary about bill murray stories than ever to write a, a movie about bill murray stories and have bill murray in it um but yeah i mean i guess because you know there's less crew and less money and all that stuff it, it attracts a lot of people or a lot of people feel like they could just make a documentary but it's it is a lot of hard work, you know, it is, it really does take, you know, um, uh, someone that can tell a story to, to do it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's, just, I guess nowadays you can do anything with scripted or all stuff with like the technologies that's out there, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is, I don't have the real good answer. I guess it's yeah. easier to get into documentaries, but it's hard, but it, doesn't 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 mean you're going to make a good one, you know? Right. Well, I would imagine that the the it, it's accessible from the standpoint that anybody can pick up a camera and start interviewing people or you know finding footage, but that to have the endurance to go four years, you know, collecting footage and have probably I would guess hundreds and hundreds of hours of footage, and then yeah. have the and then have the acumen and the judgment to know what works and what doesn't and how to craft that narrative is probably way more challenging than a scripted film director who knows exactly what needs to be on <laughs> on film and and how to cut it and that type of thing. Yeah, I mean like I feel like you know, as I mentioned I want to get into scripted stuff like I feel like having edited and directed all these documentaries has made me become a better writer in that I just know a little bit more about characters before I used to just write funny lines, you know, and now like having followed like different Santas or different people who've had Bill Murray stories or, or just different people in general. Like, I feel like I have a tendency to know a little bit more about characters, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, that I, makes sense. But also too, like before I made a documentary, I, had, you know, tried to like make i've been i've had a camera in my hands since I was 11 years old you know but i also worked in radio you know and uh, and i was a phone screener at a radio station so it's like you're 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 call, you're getting normal people who call in and trying to find something about them to make them interesting so the host of the show can have a conversation that people want to listen to and i think some of those skill sets kind of like allowed me to help make other people interesting in the documentaries yeah and and i i would guess too that that the process of just making decisions like a lot of decisions as a documentary filmmaker and pouring through footage makes you just a better decision maker in the the narrative film context too yeah i don't you know it's so funny like so many like i'm i worked with a couple people that say you just need to make a decision doesn't need to be right or wrong you know and like and i think a lot of people when they first start working with me, think I don't know what I'm doing because I don't agree to that. Like, I don't, I mean, who knows? I may not know what I'm doing, but like, <laughs> but like, but like, I just, I don't like, like, I like thinking about things. Like I'm not like a fast decision maker, you know, sometimes like if I'm like really zoned in and like, I know exactly what I want, but if someone actually has like, when someone has a question, I'm like, I don't know the answer. Like, I don't want to just say it because like, there is that fear that you're like, oh, I don't want to say the wrong thing, you know, like, even with the documentary, like the hardest thing to me about pitching things is people go, what is your vision? And it's like, I don't, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know how to make a movie until I'm making it, you know, like, <laughs> like for real, like, you know, I think 
I, I, I have a, a good way of collecting materials and collecting questions and answers and all that sort of stuff. But I do really feel that the movie presents itself while editing, you know, like it, it tells you kind of really what it wants to be, you know, um, you know, an editor for a scripted movie, there's definitely ways to change it up, but like in a documentary, like there's so many different ways to go, you know, and, Santa. I mean, there was five different movies about Santa Clauses while we were like making ours. You know, and ours is completely different than everyone else's. Um, it's just, it's just so many different ways. I mean, there's another Bill Murray uh, stories documentary. You know, like, like people will have different approaches for things, uh, and that's I don't know. Yeah, well, it sounds like they in in a documentary film context when you're getting somebody to buy into a project or a collaborate on a project. They just have to have that much more faith in you because they don't have the vision. They don't have the script. And so what they have is you and your filmography and they and your ethos within your crew about how you approach storytelling. Yeah. I just, you know, it's just like I'm learning the, the idea of like trying to like, like the, the take, you know, and like and trying to present as much as that up front as possible because I really like no one wants to hear Oh, you know, just trust me. We'll figure it out as we go along. (laughs) (laughs) But that's really it, you know? And then you talk to any director, it's really, you're just kind of, you have an idea, but you're kind of, I don't want to say lying, but you're just going, like, you're understanding, like, what do you need to know now so you trust me to understand that the process will work? Right. You know? Yeah, that makes sense. So tell us about This Is Gore. I see that's that's a project you're working on currently, and Thomas Lenn isn't involved. Are you familiar with the band Guar? Yeah. A lot. Back in the, I think they're from the 80s, maybe even the 70s. But I, I think I, they I rem- dabbled in a bunch of those different decades, yeah. Yeah, uh, very theatrical uh, metal band, right? I mean, a lot of, cos- a lot of cosplay and costumes. Yeah, yeah they're, uh, they're amazing. I, you know, um, uh, Scott's the director that he his new his first documentary, uh, the Orange Years, it should be coming out sometime this year or next year. It's all about Nickelodeon. Uh, but you know, this is I knew Scott from that Orange Years documentary, um, and uh, you know he told me about his connection with Guar, and I just Guar is one of those guys or one of those bands that like I knew of. Couldn't tell you like one song, but I knew they were in Beavis and Butthead. I knew they were in Empire Records. You know, you just like, you just knew of them. You just didn't know anything about it. So I was like, oh, let's, let's do that. And, you know, so far we've got to interview Weird Al, uh, Thomas Lennon, uh, Ethan Umbre, Alex Winter. Um, who else? Now, how was Thomas Lennon involved? I see he's attached to the film. Yeah, we interviewed him. He uh, he was on MTV during the same time they started being on MTV. You know, okay. he was on the, the state and stuff like that. So it was just kind of like that sort of like, and and the way the state kind of started, they were very like kind of like punk kids as well, you know, but like it was just kind of speaking about MTV at that time, you know, when like, because the Guar really wasn't played on TV. They kind of snuck through the back door with Beavis and Butthead, you know, like uh, Beavis and Butthead liked them on their show, which were like spoke. <laughs> Spoke pretty. I think there was even a views and behind a video game where their their whole job was to get to the Guar concert. You know, like <laughs> uh, so it's uh, it was really interesting. Oh, and then Bam Margera, we interviewed Bam. Okay. Uh, but you know, we kind of like a little bit of a on a pause with the interviews. Scott right now is just kind of editing what we have. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I just who doesn't love Guar? You know. Well, yeah. Even if you never bought their albums or listened to their music, they they're an iconic. Uh, presence in from the they're 80s. Just really, they're really smart at like just dipping their toe into pop culture every couple of years to remind you that it still exists. You know, like when they're like Jerry Springer, you know, uh, Daily Show. It's just, they're just so funny. So that project, how long do you expect it to take to complete and be uh, in, a, in a film festival context? Uh, you know, I mean, we would love for it to come out next year, but you know, uh, with COVID and all, it's like, you're just trying to, you know, the, so much of it's already shot, but you know, we, there is like a little, a couple more things that we want to get. And it's just, it's just making sure we can get them. You know, do you find that the, that there are challenges for documentary filmmakers in terms of just putting food on the table and making a living that are, 
always going to be there? And if so, how how do you manage the you know the cash flow situation? Because you're you're working for literally years and years at a time on a project, and there's these are speculative projects, I would imagine, because they're not all going to get into film festivals. They're not all going to get distribution. How do you go about? providing for your family and just making sure that you're taken care of and treated fairly in business. I mean, it's very difficult. <laughs> it's very, it's very tough. And you just have to, um, did you ever see Batman? Was it, uh, dark Knight rises? Um, was that the, which, the last which... Kristen Bale, uh, movies, the, the last one of the trilogy with, uh, uh, Bane and Catwoman. No, I did not see that one. Oh, come on. Uh, <laughs> it's is a good, good movie. Okay, I'll uh, check it out. But like, so Batman is like stuck in some like cave or some hole or something like that. And um, it was like Bane had broke his back. And there's a way out where you could you you could like swing over to this. You, there's like a gap and you just you, you have to run and jump and everyone holds onto this rope to try to get to the other side. But when they fail, like just swing down and it's just very difficult. No one, no one got out. Um, but Batman gets out by doing it without a rope. Because when you're running and uh, you have that rope, you have that safety, you know, you're, you're not, you're, you can't kind of like go that hard, you know? But when you know if you're not going to do it, you're just going to die. Right. You make it. <laughs> okay. You know, and I, and, and I think that's one of those situations where like, you just have to be that kind of have that kind of mentality of knowing that like there's there's no safety net. You just have to do this, right, right. <laughs> you know. And and I've been able to provide for my family for a couple of years now, and it's just because I have no net, <laughs> you know. Yeah, no plan B. Exactly. I think if you if you have a plan B, you know you're you're going to and you know that no matter how hard you. Uh, try to ignore the fact that there is a plan B. Your decision making is going to be affected, I think, in some way. You're not going to commit as hard to a certain path if you know you have the plan B, which is probably an easier plan. I mean, I, and I can only speak for myself too. Like I'm, you know, I've I've worked in a situation and, and know enough people um, that believe in me that it's been able to work out. You know. Talk to me next year. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I'm working at a make working somewhere else, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but like that's that's kind of my my uh, my attitude, you know. Yeah. Well, Tommy, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you, and I, I learned a lot actually. So, oh, thanks, cool. Th thanks for sitting so. down with me. Appreciate it. Oh, no problem, man. Thanks for having me. I hope I hope so. I hope certain parts I didn't sound negative or anything like that. You know, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Okay. No, this has been a great conversation, and uh, looking forward to hearing what my listeners think. Cool. How how good are you on that ukulele? Uh terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm much better. I'm much better with the uh, guitar, and I still have a banjo back there as well. I inherited from my oh, dad. And... That's what I meant. I'm so sorry. Oh, I thought yeah. that was a ukulele. That's oh, a I've got a ukulele up there too on the side. But yeah, I I'm not good on the banjo or the uke yet. But uh, gotcha. I, I plan. That's one of my my goals. That's uh that's a yet the most powerful word. There's a there's this whole Sesame Street song on that uh on that word yet, you know? Oh. So it's, it's, it's all out there. <laughs> right on. Tommy, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, Go find your dream path.